I'd invite you to please stand if you're able for the reading of today's sermon scripture. Today's verse uh, is found on page uh, 1720 in the Pew Bible in front of you. And uh, I would offer up if, if you don't have a Bible or you know someone that would like one, please take those. And uh, that's what they're there for. From Philippians 2, verses uh, 5 and 6. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. If you are interested in getting a system like that for your house, it can be procured for just a little over $10,000. That includes all the lights, that includes the computer controls, wiring, video projection, and the special equipment necessary to broadcast the music on a short-range FM channel in order that your neighbors are not ticked off every night. What it does not include, that $10,000 does not include, is that most utility companies require that you are given, or not given, you have to pay for, a second electrical service into your home to power all that so that your neighborhood electrical grid does not collapse. Is that the way you would like to spend your money here at the holidays? The National Retail Federation, I read just this week, says that the average American this year will spend $1,000 each at the holidays in a combination of gifts, decorations, uh, food, and travel. At a mid-class income, that represents one week of salary. And what's the end result of that kind of spending and in experiencing the intense rush that the holidays bring on us? Well, did you know that over 65% of all adults in America report that in January they battle post-holiday depression or blues? In other words, every new year, 65% of us as Americans experience after Christmas a struggle with deep feelings of emptiness, of loneliness, of sadness, even depression as everybody that was around you now finally goes home, as all the decorations are finally just put away, and as life's routines just begin again. And that happens each and every year. Will this year be any different? It can be. 
It can be, but only if the first step for us each is to admit that there is something essential to the holiday that's been lost or is consistently overlooked. In other words, there needs to be a confession that we've allowed the biblical focus of Advent to be replaced with a glittering but very barren counterfeit. Most can't identify what's been lost, but they feel it. There's a longing inside for something more. And yet, sadly, we tend to go through the same motions, hoping that, you know what, this year, it it really is going to be different. What motions? Typically, people that come and approach the Advent or the Christmas season with with one of four approaches. The first one is that some just simply choose to endure. Typically, they go through the holiday motions, but they simply, they just want to get it over with. They're just enduring it. So on the outside, they may be smiling. They may look very happy to you on the outside. But on the inside, they're deeply grieving, or they could be resentful, or they're deeply annoyed by all that's going on. So they grit their teeth. They they do just what's expected, but they can't wait for it all to end. That's enduring. Secondly, there's also the approach of what I call to enjoy. These individuals have decided that they really can't change the system that's going on at the end of the year, so at least they're going to get some pleasure or enjoyment out of it. So typically this time of year, they're spending way too much, they're eating way too much, they're drinking way too much, and their motto is, if you can't beat them, have another slice of fruitcake. The holidays, for those who are there just to enjoy The holidays are to savor being a consumer. There's a third approach, though, that some take, and that is to extract. You can endure. That's possible. You can enjoy. But you can also just extract, meaning there are people who don't see any intrinsic meaning uh, in the holidays. So what they try to do is use the, uh, the holiday trappings and try to extract some meaning out of it for themselves. So you see this in some trying to feel better by the gifts they give away. Their ego is stoked because, as we saw on the screen a few moments ago, they put up a light display on their home that causes traffic jams in the neighborhood. Or it could be that they want their life to have a sense of purpose, so they give a very generous donation to a cause that has meaning to them. So the elements or forms of Christmas are simply used to extract meaning for their lives. But there is a fourth way. It's a way that we're going to be exploring, and that is to engage. Rather than try to um, endure or just simply enjoy or to extract, we reject the temptation to go down those approaches, but instead we come to the weeks of the Advent with a determination that we're going to reclaim the heart of the holidays. By letting what did happen dictate what I now do today. You see, the heart of the holidays is not about the decorations. It's not about the presents. It's not about a food. It's not about the parties. It's not about the music. Folks, much of what we see out in our world today, those are just the secular trappings of the holiday. Now, listen carefully to me. The heart of the holiday is also not about a baby in the manger. A star in the sky, shepherds and sheep, or angels singing. Those are true facts. They historically happened, but they're the spiritual trappings. They are the decor. They are the expressions of the heart of Christmas. And the danger that we face, whether we're a follower of Jesus Christ or not, is to focus on the trappings and miss the heart. And the heart of Christmas begins with what the Old Testament prophets said would happen, and then the New Testament authors affirmed it actually did happen. God showed up. John chapter 1 is a wonderful uh, description of it. Let me read beginning in verse 1. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, I recognize some people may not agree with that. Some people may not personally believe it, but you cannot deny that the Bible declares point blank, God came to earth. The God of creation took the initiative to enter into his creation. And that's the mystery. That's the wonder of Advent. God came. And his coming declares he cares deeply about us, that he wants to connect to us on our level, and that we matter immensely to him. And so the heart of Christmas, it's to remember each and every year the powerful things that had to happen in order for Jesus to come and be Emmanuel. That title that's given to him, Emmanuel, meaning God with us. And that's, what's get, that's what gets lost. That's what's often overlooked each year. And yet that's what we desperately need to reclaim. And that's where we're going over these four Sundays of Advent. We're going to explore, first of all, in Philippians chapter 2. How they explain, literally, the heart of the holidays. It's not some place we normally go, is it? To, to think about Christmas stories. But this is where it really all begins. This is behind everything that the gospel tells us happened. And it tells us there were three incredible steps that Jesus took to come. And each step required a sacrificial decision to be made. And then each step then allows the next step to happen. Have your Bibles. Let's look back to Philippians chapter 2. The verses that Jesse read, verse 5 and verse 6 this morning. Here's the first step. The first sacrificial step that Jesus had to take. And there are two parts to it. Look at the verse. Let's start at verse 6. Philippians 2. Jesus Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. You see, Jesus, not Jesus, Christmas makes no sense whatsoever unless Jesus who came is God. Now, for some of you here, that statement's a snoozer. For some of you here, that statement may actually be a shocker. Because the Jesus that's described in the New Testament for us was fully God in his nature. And yes, there are some people who think that Jesus was simply God-like, that he pointed people to God, that he used a very special vocabulary. In other words, in their minds, Jesus is really nothing more than a good teacher, uh, maybe a great model, maybe an admired hero. And those kinds of, that kind of thinking may be intended as a compliment, but it's horrifically wrong and biblically inaccurate. Because Philippians 2.6 points to the fact that Jesus was in his very nature God. That's again what John 1, what I read just a few moments ago, asserts. Jesus was there at the very beginning before creation was ever, ever happened. He created everything that we see around us. And that's the bold, powerful declaration. Jesus Christ is God. So let's just take this another step further. That means, as God, Jesus had every advantage and benefit of being divine. So we often say, God is omniscient. Well, that means then Jesus also would know everything. We say, God is omnipotent. Well, then that means Jesus is all-powerful and nothing is impossible for him. We say that God is sovereign. Well, then that means Jesus is fully in control. We say God is eternal, and that means Jesus has no beginning, he has no end, he does not age, he does not develop. God is holy, and that means Jesus is the moral standard 
for the whole universe. We say God is infinite. And that means Jesus himself, he has no limits, no borders, no time, space, restrictions. Okay, try to pull all that together. Here at Advent, there is an incredible mystery that we acknowledge. That Jesus coming to earth was both fully God and fully man at the same time. John 1.14, the word became flesh and, dwell, and made his dwelling among us. Now I admit, there is no analogy, there is no picture um, that I can give you that will fully illustrate or, or explain this. The truth of the incarnation that we're going to be exploring in these coming weeks literally stretches our, our, to the, our minds to the very limits of what we think is possible or we can even begin to imagine. It's mystery indeed that Jesus, while on earth, was both fully God and fully man. That's the first step that we need to understand. That was a part of what Jesus did. Jesus in coming, he was God. But here now we add the second aspect of that first step. Look back again, Philippians 2, verse 6. So he was in the form of God. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So yes, we do acknowledge, we do affirm correct theology and and truth that Jesus was God, but then we stand in awe at that last statement that Jesus who came, he let go. Let Let that sink in, the truth of that statement. Jesus refused to grasp. That word grasp there describes holding on to something tightly out of an assertion that it's mine. There are parents here. There are grandparents here. You have seen this in your kids or in your grandkids. You've seen them when they were about the toddler age. They're holding tightly onto a toy and they're declaring what? Mine. (laughs) That's the idea of grasping. The verbal proclamation of mine is then backed up by the physical grip of the hand on that object. In order to come to earth, Jesus made the decision that he would not grasp or hold on tightly to what was rightfully his as God. Think about it this way. It's not a perfect illustration, but it's the best I can come up with. Imagine that one gloomy, rainy afternoon, you've got an appointment, and you have to go down to, uh, for the very first time in your life, to the large Cleveland Clinic complex downtown. You struggle to find a parking place, and you end up in one of their garages, but you don't know what level you need to be on to get to where you need to be. You don't even know what pedestrian bridge to use to get to the right building. You're lost. By the way, I've been there, done that, got the T-shirt. So is my wife. So imagine you're standing outside your car. You don't know which way to go. And another driver sees your confusion. He stops, rolls down his window, realizes you're lost, and he kindly offers to park now in beside you and walk with you where you need to go because he knows about the hospital. You say, thank you. As you walk together, you find out that this man is the chief surgeon at the hospital. When you come to the doors coming into the entrance, you see right next to the front door is a parking place that's reserved, and his name is there that's reserved for him. He has a superior advantage because of his status. He gets that parking spot. However, in deference to your need, he did not use his rightfully deserved parking spot, but rather helped you find your way into the hospital. So here's the question. At any time when he was walking with you, did he stop being a doctor or was he no longer the chief surgeon? Well, obviously the answer is no. Did he still have all the special advantages that his position gave to him and at any time he could have used them, 
but for your sake, he chose not to in that particular moment. See, that begins to help us understand what Jesus has done for us. That in coming, he made the voluntary choice to release many of his divine advantages. Now, don't misunderstand, Christ did not surrender any attribute of being God, but he did restrict their use. The creator of the universe, the creator of the universe chose to become limited by a human body, and initially it was an infant body at that. So think about that. The one who set the stars in place began by not even being able to walk. The one to whom nature obeys is so helpless, someone has to change his diaper. Jesus is the creator. And now, he's chosen. I'm going to be limited by time. The one who existed from eternity past and will always exist, now has to wait for things to happen, just like us. Here is God's son who commands the forces of heaven and is worshipped there. And now some people that he walks among could care less that he is there. He who is holy and pure now faces temptation. As God, he needs nothing. Now he needs food. He needs clothing. He needs sleep. He'll know what pain is like. He'll know what loneliness is like. Jesus, who sits at the right hand of God the Father, allowed people to misunderstand him, thwart him, question his motives, his sanity, his integrity. Jesus refused to let any divine benefit or advantage that he had as God to become a barrier to enter into life as we all know it. Jesus became like us in order to identify with us so that he can say with complete sincerity, I know what life is like for you. I know how you feel. So that's the first step in reclaiming the heart of Christmas is that behind the scenes is there is a realization that we must grasp and hold on to and that is Jesus was God but Jesus deliberately let it go. And the moment we realize that we are faced with a dramatic choice. What will I do? In other words, what difference does this make in the way I celebrate Christmas? Well, back into our text again. Did you notice that verse 6 is preceded by verse 5? Pretty logical. What's verse 5 tell us? Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, In other words, if our approach to the holidays is we are really going to engage with it at its heart level, then I'm not given the luxury to simply applaud Jesus for what he did. I have to apply it in my own life. Have this mind. And some of your translations say mindset among yourselves, which was yours in Christ Jesus. So what is the specific Christ-like mindset that I'm to pursue Well, let's quickly review. Again, Jesus released his rights in order to connect deeply with us. He was unwilling to let a benefit that was his become a barrier to identifying with this. So how does that touch my life? Here's the specific attitude. Am I willing to release my rights? Am I willing to release what I feel like I'm owed, what I'm entitled to, in order to connect deeply with the people who live around me? I mean, just think about it for a moment. Just think about the potential areas that that, having that kind of a mindset could, could impact. So what if I let go of my rights in the area of my education? 
I mean, don't I have a right to use the degree that I spent so much money and invested so much of my time to, to earn? I mean, I, was, I would never consider taking a job in, a, in, in another field. Really? What does it mean to let go of my rights potentially in my finances or my standard of living? I mean, don't I have a right to have a certain lifestyle? So please don't ask me to live on less or to give more away or to simplify. Or what about letting go in, of my rights in the area of my social standing? I was raised uh, in a certain class or among a certain class of people and race of people, and that's who I relate best to. So don't ask me to go outside that circle where skin color and language or culture is different. What about my comfort? Am I willing to lay down the expectation that following Jesus is always going to be convenient? It's always going to be easy. Or what about my personal satisfaction? I mean, we all tend to want to enjoy and find satisfaction in the things we surround ourselves with and the choices we make. But what if going outside your comfort zone and doing something that we think is risky and unnatural might just connect us with someone who needs Jesus? Have this mindset among yourselves, which is yours. In Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Am I hanging on to my rights? Or am I willing to follow my Savior and release my rights in order to serve God's purposes in this generation by helping people come to know and follow Jesus themselves. And that's where we're headed in the next three weeks. As part of reclaiming the heart of the holiday, we're going to have the opportunity to practice, not just study God's word, which is a powerful thing. That ought to be at the, the foundation of it all. But from there, then we're going to have the opportunity to practice and follow the example of, of Jesus in the very same decisions he made in order to come to earth as Emmanuel. Here's how we're going to do it, in one way anyway. You may have already seen as you came in the morning, this morning that just the absolutely wonderful decorations that are in uh, so much of the church. Man, a big thanks needs to go to Whitney and her team that spent all last week putting that up. It's gorgeous. If you've been, yes. If you have not been in the connecting hallway between the gathering area and going over into the children's wing, you may have already been there and you've seen the big Christmas tree there. And you may have noticed the title above it. It's called Giving Tree. It's covered with a bunch of special ornaments, like these. Each one, each of these ornaments has a personal description and way for you to enter into the heart of Christmas by an act of service that models what Jesus did for us. What we're going to be doing over these days of Advent is encouraging every time you come to church, take one of these. And then in the following week, go do what's written on there. And then the next Sunday when you come back, grab a new one. And there, by the way, there's going to be a variety of options. They're not all the same. There are literally dozens of, of options up there for you. So, for example, if you've never done something like this, you'll find some of the service opportunities that fit right where you are of taking some maybe first steps and giving yourself away. But for some of you who have known Jesus and have been following him for many, many years, there are going to be some others up there that are rather risky, some sacrificial ones for you to consider taking. They're age-specific. The lower ones are the brown ones, and these are for the kids. The middle layer ones are red, and these are for the ones in our student ministry. And then the ones more mid-level, maybe chest high, and up to the very top of the tree are ivory, and those are for us as adults. So may I suggest that every Sunday you come in, go by the tree. Read what's, what's asked of how you can give yourself away sacrificially to somebody else. Again, start maybe more 
carefully, but each Sunday try to press the envelope. But pray about it right now. About what do I need to let go of? Even a legitimate right uh, or expectation. Something you think you're owed. And allow the Lord to take you someplace you've never dreamed you would ever go before. We did this great giving tree uh, idea up in Baxter, Minnesota at an interim that Lucy and I were in there. One of the ornaments said, when you go through a drive through line, um, pick up the tab for the person behind you. I don't know if you've ever done that, but that's going to be one of the ones on the tree. I don't remember if it was a Jack in the Box or a Burger King. I think it was a Burger King that was in town. I can't guarantee it, but I believe this is what happened. That one of our church members went in and did that. Started and went through, ordered, and said, by the way, I'm going to just pay for the person behind me. The cashier said, sure, that's a great idea. And rang up both, and the guy went on. The next person drove up, was told that that person in front of you that drove in away paid for your meal. He said, or she, I don't remember who, it was, what it was, who the person was, said, well, then I'll pay for the person behind me. It went on for 18 hours. Everybody kept saying, I'll pay for the person behind me. Regardless of what you in past years may have chosen to endure, to enjoy, to extract. How about if together we link arms and engage? Starting today, all the way through Christmas Eve.